Good morning. Buenos días. Welcome, bienvenidos, to the San Antonio Public Library. I am Amy Alemany, co-chair of the Sociedad Herencia Puertorriqueña 2019 cultural event. Today, you and I continue to celebrate Sociedad Herencia Puertorriqueña's 35th anniversary from its founding in the city of San Antonio in the year 1984. 35 years ago, when a group of dedicated Puerto Rican women who cared about their families lived fully but missed their island's traditions, music, and culture, together, resourcefully and creatively, they developed a plan to promote and maintain their Puerto Rican culture and traditions, not only amongst themselves, but with the city and its communities. Among Sociedad Herencia Puerto Riqueña's hallmarks are the fundraising event, the Puerto Rico Festival in San Antonio for the scholarship program, the annual scholarship program, which has awarded over $100,000 and reached over 150 young students, the traditional Three Kings Day in the San Fernando Cathedral Hall every January, the cultural events highlighting Puerto Rican culture, musicians such as Victoria Sanabria, Charlie Hernandez, artists and graphic designers such as Antonio Martorell, world-renowned baritone Antonio Barasorda, storytellers like Tina Casanova, and writers and authors just like Esmeralda Santiago, among others. We are extremely happy and honored to have you and your families join us in our 2019 cultural event, Images and Memories, celebrating Esmeralda Santiago's work. This program was made possible in part with a grant from Humanities Texas, the state affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities, so we're very grateful. Let's start by welcoming Ms. Haley Holmes, who is the administrator of the San Antonio Public Library. Thank you, Amy. Good morning, my name is Haley Holmes. I'm the Public Services Administrator for the Central Library. Thank you for joining us today in this partnership with the Puerto Rican Heritage Society in celebrating their 35th anniversary. We're very excited to host the acclaimed Esmeralda Santiago at our beautiful Central Library. 
Before we begin the program, I would like to thank the San Antonio Public Library Foundation for their support, as well as NowCast SA for their support this morning. I'd also like to thank the Puerto Rican Heritage Society for making this event possible in partnership with our Latino Collection and Resource Center. The Latino Collection and Resource Center, which we call LCRC, was founded as a cultural resource to chronicle Latino stories and the unique heritage experience and contemporary life of all Latin Americans in the United States. Today is particularly special because we are joined by one of Latino literature's most well-known authors. Esmeralda Santiago's works have defined the literature of the Puerto Rican diaspora, tracing her childhood in Puerto Rico and her family's migration to the US. These are life experiences not dissimilar to many in this room today. On behalf of the San Antonio Public Library, I hope you enjoy today's program and explore our beautiful library when the program is over and our Latino Collection and Resource Center, which is located on the northwest side of the first floor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Haley. She and her team have helped us tremendously, so a very special thank you to Haley and the team of the San Antonio Public Library. I now want to ask Ms. Luz Garcia, President of Sociedad Herencia Puerto Riqueña, to join us at the stage. Thank you. Good morning. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. Welcome and thank you for joining us today at this very special occasion where Sociedad Herencia Puerto Riqueña, 35th anniversary, and our 2019 cultural event. I want to recognize and say thanks to Humanities Texas, to San Antonio Public Library, especially to Ramiro Salazar, director, to Haley Holmes and their wonderful team, and each of you for making today's event possible. Welcome. A million thank yous to our wonderful cultural event committee, especially for Olga, Amy, Belinda. So we have a small token of appreciation for Olga. <laughs> You don't know that. <laughs> so she worked so hard, you will never believe. She, she has been planning this for more than a year, so we are very proud of our members, all the participating members, but especially of the cultural event that they put long hours to make this happen. So, you may ask why we selected Esmeralda Santiago. During this morning, you are going to learn why Esmeralda Santiago is Sociedad Herencia Puerto Riqueña birthday gift to our San Antonio people and to all of you. Please enjoy your day. Thank you. Thank you, Luz. Now I want to welcome a very special uh, guest today, other than Esmeralda, of course. Uh, she's the news producer for News 4 San Antonio, Lynette Vega. Good morning, buenos dias. Buenos dias. It's a beautiful looking crowd today. I'm so happy that you all are here today to welcome Esmeralda. Uh, as Amy said, my name is Lynette Vega. I'm a news producer for News 4 San Antonio, and we are also sister stations with Fox 29 and the CW35 here in San Antonio. I'm honored to be here today with you all, as well as with the Puerto Rican Heritage Society, who is marking 35 years of excellence in San Antonio. 
Today we're introducing a woman who is remarkable in every way. Esmeralda Santiago is a native Puerto Rico, is a native Puerto Rican born on our beautiful island. She moved to the United States mainland at the age of 13. She's the eldest of 11 children, raised by a strong single mother in Brooklyn, New York, who she affectionately calls mommy in her works. There, Esmeralda focused her efforts on learning English, helping her mommy adjust to their new surroundings, and learning more about her identity. A goal Esmeralda describes during this time period is wanting to be independent, working hard, and getting paid for it. It's that need for independence and a growing curiosity that propels her forward into her next successes and uh, what she has uh, many of them. Esmeralda graduated magna cum laude from Harvard University and wrote three memoirs. The first, titled When I Was Puerto Rican, came out in 1993 and was named one of the best memoirs of a generation by Oakwood Book Club. Her next two memoirs, Almost a Woman, followed in 1998 and The Turkish Lover in 2004. Esmeralda is also the author of a 2011 epic novel called Conquistadora, which tells coming-of-age stories, including that of its heroine who travels to the new world just ahead of the Civil War. Esmeralda is also the author of three novels, a children's book, and her works have um, also been turned into films, including her first novel, America's Dream. I'm um, sorry, it has been uh, turned into a film, America's Dream. Esmeralda is described as the founding mother of New York literature, and the title is fitting. Esmeralda herself says when she arrived to the United States, she felt invisible and did not see Latin representation in the media, describing in an interview that the only Latino on TV at the time was Ricky Ricardo from I Love Lucy. <laughs> <laughs> Times have changed thanks to authors like Esmeralda. That representation has evolved thanks to her voice and thanks to her ability to give Puerto Rico a voice. She's also a champion for young artists everywhere. It's Esmeralda's personal journey into finding out more about her roots that has helped others find and keep their own connection and identity to the island that we all call home. As the Puerto Rican Heritage Society has done for the past 35 years in helping encourage and support the spirit and culture of Puerto Ricans, Esmeralda is a reminder that we must not only experience what it means to be Boricua, but we must also be aware of the need to share that experience, our traditions, our faith, and our artistry with everyone. Without further ado, please help me in welcoming our guest of honor today, Ms. Esmeralda Santiago. I was 13, 
and about to learn that love meant having to say you're sorry mm. over and over. <laughs> <laughs> that summer, Mommy decided to leave Puerto Rico for the United States. As Papi drove us to the airport, he sang along with Brenda Lee on the radio. What does the song say? I asked. Lo siento, Papi said. Lo siento tanto. Mommy sat next to him, lips taut. She had spent two weeks in New York before deciding to move there. Did she understand what Brenda Lee was helping my father say to her? <laughs> Bobby had chosen to send us away rather than marry her. After we waited goodbye that afternoon, neither Mommy nor I nor my six sisters and brothers would see him again for eight years. But Brooklyn was a reader's delight. The streets were labeled, the buildings numbered, neon signs hissed and flashed over storefronts, shadowed letters curved across plain glass windows, opened, closed, checks cashed. Messages were scrawled over the mailboxes in the lobby for our apartment building, for rent, for sale, keep door closed, or as I would say in Espanol, for rent, for sale. <laughs> Chapter books 
with an English to English dictionary alongside, reasoning that every time I looked up a word in English, I could learn a few more. By the time I started ninth grade, a year after we arrived in Brooklyn, I was reading at the 10th grade level. I could read, understand, and spell the words, but was afraid to speak them. In Spanish, every vowel, every vowel and consonant has one specific sound. In English, the same vowel could have different sounds. The A in apple or apex, for example. The I in I or N-U-E. Consonants were sometimes silent and sometimes not. I should never say que ni fe for knife or que si for psychology. <laughs> During my first two years in New York, I was silent, although I had acquired an impressive vocabulary. My tongue refused to form, to form the th sound. I practiced tongue twisters to help develop the necessary muscles. I thought, I thought, but the thought I thought wasn't the thought I thought I thought. <laughs> My tortured disowns and confused bottles were a constant embarrassment, but a source of mirth to others. To avoid the laughter, I smiled as if I too thought it was funny. Later, I hunched over a notebook, writing out my frustration, shame, and rage. I lived in those pages, in English and Spanish, where the written word said what I couldn't utter. Reading gave me language. Writing gave me a place to be myself. By the time I returned to Puerto Rico for a visit, I could read the most challenging literature in English and manage modern American slang with few stumbles. I had learned an entirely new Anglophone way of life, even as my roots remained firmly planted in Spanish. A is for apple. M is for mango. I'm a hybrid, straddling two cultures, two languages, two lives, celebrating the growth that is inherent in all this, but aware, too, that there have been losses. I'm sorry, so sorry. That first phrase I learned, so full of regret, still lingers. Finally, 
being able to read like a whole novel by this lovely, lovely librarian whose name I wish I remembered because uh, I, I'm so grateful to her. Um, and she gave me a tree grows in Brooklyn. And I'm like, hey, tree! <laughs> Yay! <laughs> There wasn't one in our neighborhood, you know, <laughs> Frankie's neighborhood there was one. But so so it, there was this, this between country and city problem that I had that took me much longer to resolve than learning English because I loved to read and I knew that, that I had to do it because I was the eldest and I had to help my mother and, you know, when you have that many children, you are constantly in the emergency room. <laughs> I can tell you, I know medical words that I remember because I had to learn them in order to, to help my mom, who I found out when she was when she was dying, pardon me, she uh, had, a, had a surgery. And so she woke up from the surgery speaking perfect English. <laughs> I'm not exaggerating. My sisters and I were like, what? She has known English all these years? <laughs> we have been like running from one place to another, always you know, not going to work so that we could take her to the doctor. I mean, just, but she came out of this surgery. She spoke English like, like amazing. It was amazing. So some some weeks later, I had to go and you know, had a, a procedure, and um, I said to my doctor about the story, and I said, you know, my mother woke up from this anesthesia, she could speak English beautifully. I said, would you please whisper French into my ear? <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
much information, and they constantly, you know, they often reminded me of that money. That's not enough money. It's okay. You don't have to go into it. <laughs> but those are the kinds of things. I don't, you know, I think it's partly who I was when I came here, and then who I had to become, because I had to become the translator for mommy and for my siblings until everybody uh, could speak enough English. Um, and so, so there's this constant process of, of educating, really. I, I, I'm still a translator in many ways. I'm still translating into English when I'm speaking to you. Por eso es que a veces que no sé si estoy hablando español o inglés o francés. So it's, it's, it stays with you and you're not even aware of what that process is hasta que te sientas a escribir o tienes que explicárselo a alguien or for some reason you are reminded that you're in the middle of a process that doesn't end. It just doesn't end. It doesn't end when I go to Puerto Rico, I have to start over, you know? I speak English 99% of the, of the time. Y en cuanto llego a Puerto Rico, I have to, like, it took me. It, it takes me, like, just a few hours. A, a, a poder hablar entonces el español así con, con la rapidez, con el um, and, um, and so this, so it's a constant, constant um, awareness of, of what's happening. Um, it may not be that for everyone, but because my work is about the process, I'm extremely aware of it. Everything I eat is, a, is an event for me, you know? <laughs> Every, everything that I see, everyone that I meet, because it's all part of, of that process and my constant, um, I guess it's a necessity now for me to, to, to um, translate it in some way for others. So, um, so I think I've had enough. I've told you enough about me. <laughs> and I would love to know if you have any questions or I can keep talking. Si, sí, senora. <laughs> Sí, le quiero decir algo cortito, pero estoy bien agradecida al grupo de, de que tenemos con Daniel aquí y con la, aquí estamos aquí todos presentes, casi todos presentes y este, pero nos ponemos juntos este, cada, cada mes y cuando, y, y, y votamos por el libro que vamos a, cada mes tenemos un libro que vamos a a leer y después nos juntamos, nos unimos a, a, a presentar, a ver qué ideas o qué aprendimos o qué no aprendimos. <laughs> and so, anyway, I want to thank uh, Daniel for, for being such a, uh, a fascinating uh, guide to give us, keep us going and keep us, come, remind us we're having a book up meeting, don't forget. And so, uh, Anyway, to make it short and sweet, I wanted to tell you, Miss Santiago, Esmeralda, por favor, that you have inspired me. The books that we read, which was when I was Puerto Rican, that was our first one, and Almost a Woman, and um, those were great. And what you're telling us now, right now, that's amazing to me because I can, I can, focus on, on what you're saying, I can relate it to myself, because I had a very interesting life. And now, um, I just want to make it short and sweet, because because of you, because of Daniel, and because all of us that are in Brooklyn, that inspired me to write, I'm going to write, I don't call myself a writer, but I'm going to write, but you're an inspiration to me. And now, right now, that's just beautiful. I can relate to what you're saying, telling us. But um, I want to write a little memoir of my uh, childhood. My parents, my grandmother, my aunts and uncles, where I was born and, and here, my education here. And these, are, um, I bought six of these little books, or my husband, significant other, um, <laughs> taxi man, um, 
bought for me. I told him I needed something small, and he found them. I have, um, this is a blue one, I have a green. I have four children. I was very blessed to have four children, and so I wanted four of these, but actually five, because I'm gonna keep one for us, <laughs> so that I can, but I wanna handwrite them. Some told me, well, you can make copies. What my, oh, my question. Well, okay, so I'm sorry, I'm going on. I like to chat, but um, I, I just wanted, a, not a question, but just to tell you my feelings about your book, about your life, just um, amazing, and that I'm gonna write for my children, my upbringing, and it's kind of gonna be inspirational. Yeah. As it's, uh, Thank you. I, I, I started to write really when my first child was born. My, my husband and I were living in a, in a suburb, uh, southern, uh, south of Boston, and I was sure I was the only Puerto Rican in this whole town. And every time I would go just about anywhere, the <coughs> grocery, the post office, any little shop, they always asked me where I was from. Constantly asking about this, and so at first I was like, I mean, you know, they're not asking me where I'm from. They're asking me, what are you doing here? <laughs> so then, then it really the answer began to change. My my experience began to change, and um, and so when when our child was you know several months old, it occurred to me that uh, if I didn't write about my experiences, if I didn't say who I was and what I was doing there, um, he would never know. How would he know, you know? And so my writing really began from that, that desire to share my life with my children and my husband, who didn't know a lot of it, even though we knew each other very well. Um, and I, I think we all have a story. And you don't all have to be famous published authors like Stephen King or Danielle Steele or whatever. You have to be the writer for you. Uh, I really write for that. I, I write for that little 13-year-old girl who couldn't find any books about her life, you know, because I, I, I felt so alone in that experience. And so, uh, especially those of us who, who have children, who uh, maybe are just so involved with their you know, devices and, and with their own lives, which they should be doing, because I, that's why we bring them into the world so that they can become the people that they're supposed to be. But it's important for them to know their story. And so you can write these stories in a lovely notebook like that. I use these big composition notebooks because they remind me of school for some reason. Um, and, and, and just just own them. And don't be embarrassed and don't be ashamed and complain in it. You know, I write a lot of complaints in my, in my journals because how else am I going to express some of the things that are happening to me? It's not all about, you know, flowers and, uh, and rainbows, you know? Some of the things I need to say, I can only say to the page. And um, I think it makes it easier in my interpersonal relationship that I've already taken care of that stuff, you know, in those notebooks. Uh, but being able to share your life, your history with your children is the biggest gift you can give them. One of the, you know, of this one, my, before my parents passed away, I recorded them because I realized I didn't know that much about them. You know, I lived with them in the same place for years and there was a lot I didn't know. So I had to kind of convince them to allow me to, 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 to interview them. And I learned so much about them, things that you know my other siblings didn't know that they didn't ask. So I encourage you to do that with your elders and, and just value them enough that their story is important because it's going to be important for you. So there's a question. Hey, buenos días. Mi nombre es José Repagán. Soy boricua, eh, manatieño radicado aquí en San Antonio hace dos años. Eh, primero que todo, gracias por la oportunidad. 
Yo me atrevo a decir que pocas escritoras puertorriqueñas conectan con la diáspora boricua como lo hace usted. Usted tiene la oportunidad de viajar mucho, habla con boricuas en la isla y habla con los boricuas que estamos aquí. Para los que estamos aquí, Puerto Rico no está, nosotros no estamos en Puerto Rico, pero Puerto Rico sí está en nosotros. Yo quiero, yo tengo mucha curiosidad por escucharle a usted. Eh, ¿Hay una diferencia entre los temas de los que le hablan los boricuas que siguen en la isla en comparación con los boricuas que, que estamos ahora del lado de acá? Y segundo, aunque sé que esto no es una conferencia de prensa, que es un conversatorio, conozco muy bien la diferencia. Si hay alguna novedad respecto a sus proyectos profesionales, recientemente su obra fue llevada al teatro en Puerto Rico. Hay un libro en el panorama que de alguna manera eh, evoca la figura del jíbaro. Eh, si hay alguna actualización o algo nuevo en, en el camino. Bueno, en, en, la última pregunta se lo comento primero. Eh, hace como tres semanas o cuatro semanas estuve en Puerto Rico porque una compañía que se llama Casa Productora a, a, montó un, una, una función de cuando era puertorriqueña. Ellos escribieron el guión. Yo no estuve, yo no fui parte de, 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 del proceso porque para mí eso fue el arte de ellos. Ellos son escritores, son actores, eh, músicos, y yo les dije, ok, tienen permiso, pero yo quiero verlo. <risa> que no, no me tenga algo ahí. Que no. eh, pero y fue una experiencia bien emocionante para mí y para mi familia. Yo no quise nada más conmigo y, y, y en cuanto se, las, las luces las prenden mis hermanas en pie de San Mayor. <risa> y todas ahí con mucha máscara y, 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 y fue porque por primera vez nosotras vimos a nuestros padres como jóvenes con niños chiquitos y, y esa experiencia aunque yo escribí la historia como que a, verlos en, en live <risa> fue una cosa tan y tan tremenda no se parecen a nadie en la familia. Esos actores eran buenos actores, pero no se parecen tanto a mi, mi amigo, a mi, a mi, a mi, a mi padre. Pero, pero fue tan impactante para mí escuchar las palabras que mis papás nos decían a nosotras. Ah, eso fue algo bien maravilloso. ¿Tenemos que entender eso? ¿O es más grave la pena que la escuchaste? Eh, y la pregunta, la primera pregunta acerca de cómo los puertorriqueños en Puerto Rico... ¿De qué, hablan los, ¿De qué le hablan los boricos que se quedan en la isla y de qué le hablan los boricos que nos movemos a esto? Los que estamos aquí tenemos esa nostalgia, ese, ese deseo de estar allá. Eso es lo que, lo que yo oigo de muchos de los puertorriqueños aquí. Sean los que estamos aquí desde hace, yo estoy aquí desde 40 años, o los que acaban de llegar a pie. Ese, ese deseo de estar en la isla nunca se va. Eh, los que están en Puerto Rico antes del huracán. Porque informaría la, las opiniones de los puertorriqueños que nunca se habían ido de la isla acerca de nosotros los que estábamos fuera. Era bien Y you're not Puerto Rican. Eso es lo que se oía donde quiera que yo iba, me lo decían a mí, me lo decían a mis hermanos, a mis amigas, todo el mundo. Uh, pero después del huracán, cuando de repente nosotros los de aquí, we stepped up, y nosotros no dejábamos que, que, que los medios se olvidaran de lo que estaba sucediendo, nosotros nos fuimos a recolectar cosas para enviar, enviamos dinero, traímos familia aquí para que estuvieran aquí cuidándolos mientras estaban, uh, las cosas estaban poniendo un poquito mejor para ellos. We, Did that for them. Y eso a ellos no se les había ocurrido hasta que no, hasta, hasta ese desastre, no se les había ocurrido that we were good people too. <risa> 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 no, es verdad. Yo cuando, en el 1970, cuando empieza la palabra New York, ustedes, you remember, that was not a compliment. <risa> It was not. Y ahora, pues, es algo diferente. Ahora es algo distinto. Y creo que eso cambió el diálogo 
en la isla, porque la última vez que yo fui, yo entendí, y me lo decía, I was, always, I was such a snob, <risa> pero decía, yo, yo tan orgullosa, y, y yo, yo no traté a los, los, los puertorriqueños que vivían afuera con, con, muy bien, pero ahora yo entiendo, y, y so that, that, ese desastre ha cambiado el diálogo, I think. Y eso está seguro. I'm not glad they have hurt me. I'm not. Pero I'm glad that the conversation has changed and the attitude has changed. Yo me acuerdo. And I know there's another question. I, I go into these small things because yeah. my mind. Yeah. <laughs> I'm remembering um, los lo puertorriqueños en la isla que siempre dividían a los que, los que nacimos allá y los que nacimos en otra parte, ¿verdad? So what happens? Sonia Sotomayor, the rebelde she said Boricua, all of a sudden. <laughs> I mean, it's like, she didn't, you know, she was born in the Bronx. She was what you would have called a New Yorker. <laughs> Pero now, ahora que she Sotio Sotomayor, es que las cosas cambian, depende de cómo, de cómo cambia la cultura y la sociedad. Así que, you know, the, the, the more, The more good things you do as a Puerto Rican here, the more Puerto Rican you become over there. <laughs> comment and I have a question. You're talking about switching uh, English, Spanish, and back and forth, and you don't miss a beat. Uh, at one point in time, I, I'm a native San Antonian, so Mexican-American culture, but relate a lot to your story as well. A lot of customs, a lot of beliefs, and things like that. Um, but there are later studies that say actually that's a third way and a higher uh, level of speaking because you can switch, whereas in, in other, even other languages, that may not be that possible. But, um, but here, we were demeaned, and it's like, well, you really don't know Spanish, and you really don't know English, but now I understand that actually it's another skill. Uh, so that's just my comment. My question uh, is that, I think in our book club we had a, a difference of opinion uh, relating to your your story and your history of abuse uh, by your mother, it seemed like, mostly. But I had a difference of opinion in that I thought your father was more abusive in the sense that um, he didn't marry uh, your mother uh, and yet sent him to New York and instantly he marries. And then there were all these like, you know, his disappearances, las parandas, I don't know, whatever it was. And uh, so how do you answer that question? Because uh, I had a question about that. I'm still about whether he was abusive also or mostly or just... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wh whether it was abuse of a different kind. Yeah. A kind of abuse, I don't know what you would he call it. my brother up. You know, because if the first boy, so there were three girls, then there was a boy, there were two girls, then there was a boy. And he, he was so much harder on my young brother, um, so that he's still traumatized. I mean, he's in his 60s now. Oh. He's traumatized by the fact that, that my father, who you would meet him and you think, oh, he's always bien alegre, bien contento, mucho chiste, and all that stuff, you would never think that he would be a violent person, but his expectations on my brothers were so much higher than the expectations of his daughters. Yeah. So mommy had the opposite issue. Um, and, uh, and also, you know, I think regarding their, their issues around that is that my mother was really 17 when I was born. She was a young woman. And all of a sudden, she has three kids, da, 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 cuatro, siete, seis, siete, oh, siete hijos. Oh. She had seven children by the time she was 29 years old. So, so she, she didn't have the resources to understand, really, how to raise children. She had been an only daughter um, with an alcoholic mother. So she didn't come from a situation where she understood 
anything but what she saw. And so that's what she passed on to, to us. And I didn't really understand a lot of that until I wrote my books and, and had, to, had to look at my parents, not as my parents, but as people. You know, as adults, and, and, and people were struggling. You know, they were really poor. Um, they were undereducated. They were frustrated with one another. My father was Don Quixote. My mother was like, I can't even begin. I don't even have a, 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 an image of who she was. You know, she was very volatile and very emotional and very passionate. And um, and. Those two should have never come together, basically. <laughs> you know, they, and, I, and I didn't figure it out until I started writing about them. And I began to understand that they were so different, but they loved each other to the very end. They loved each other. Um, so I, I have forgiven a lot of that. Uh, I've forgiven it all, really. Um, I felt, I feel like they did what they could with what they had and what they knew. And as they get older and more mature and they learn more and they see what was going on, my younger siblings had a very different experience with my mom. And so we always talk about it, you know, there's 11 of us, and whenever we would get together, we would always say we each had a different mother because, you know, <laughs> I'm, like, I'm, I'm two generations away from my youngest sibling. And so they had completely different um, she had a completely different way of, you know, dealing with them, you know. I, because I was the eldest, everything I did was a challenge to her. I mean, and I'll give you an example. I'm sorry, I could go over. Um, when I returned to Puerto Rico, so I was, I had been, I left Puerto Rico, or I was taken from Puerto Rico when I was 13. I returned when I was 25, and my sister Edna was around 17 years old. And Edna and I had always been very close because she, of all the other siblings, she was the most artistic, you know, like me. And so we had, we had a lot, our personalities were very much in sync. And so, so I, I go to see my mom and Edna is like dressed like with the minis and uh, <laughs> everything. Pofuera. <laughs> time for a couple more questions. Just one? One question. You choose it, Esmeralda. You choose it. Hi. Uh, my mom gave me um, Almost a Woman, and, before, and when I was Puerto Rican, I was 13. Um, and I was still living in the island, so I left the island when I was 24, and I felt very seen because the internet was just coming into play in like this global culture, so I felt like in between two cultures. Um, and when I was in grad school, I read The Turkish Lover, and um, you talk about El Que Dirán, right? So that's something that we all know from our moms. Um, so, you know, we always felt between two cultures, and I wonder if, if you still feel that way. 
if I feel that I'm still in two cultures? That you're still between two cultures. Yeah, I am. I'm, I'm actually more than two cultures at this point. I really consider myself sort of an international culture <laughs> because I travel around the world. And, um, and like I had to, I remember, you know, when I had to go to India, right? You would think people, you know, you work about what, what, what you're going to wear, all these kind of things. But I really studied the cultural norm so that I wouldn't do something stupid. You know? <laughs> like, even with, like eating with my left hand kind of thing. Those kinds of little details are things that I really look because I'm aware that different cultures and different societies have different customs. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I study it before I, I go to those places so that I can actually feel comfortable myself within a new environment, but also so that they are not uncomfortable with me. Uh, by making, you know, having to point out something dumb but <laughs> if, if they feel like they can. And some, in some cultures they will do it, in some places they won't. But you can, you can see your face. Yeah. <laughs> you can see it. You can see the body there. So, so I, I feel that while I'm, I'm living in this uh, United States American life and this Puerto Rican life is, let's say, you know, the biggest portion of it, but when I'm outside of the continental United States or outside of our island of Puerto Rico, I'm a different person there because I'm very aware, I become aware of what else is around me. And I think that this experience, if you if you accept it and value it, then it makes you a better traveler. Because all of a sudden you know, you know what you're going through, you know what they're going through, what the host culture is going through. And so it makes it easier for you to be a traveler. And um, and so I, I I not travel alone all the time. <laughs> and my mother still to the very first day she said, Do what does it do? I go alone, I, I go places alone and I'm comfortable, you know. Pero pero I do feel now that I belong in the world, not just here or there. I really belong in this whole earth, and and I try to be respectful of other cultures as much as I can if I if I know what the issues are. Um, so it's it's a it's it's a gift, you know. After this trauma, the the llevarme de Puerto Rico a Brooklyn to this labyrinth, it has been a gift for me ultimately in my entire life because my life has a completely different trajectory than it would have had. Um, and, and a very different trajectory when I realized that I'm in, in Brooklyn and I said, I am not going to stay here. <laughs> and the minute I decided I was not going to stay there because I did not like it there, um, I, had to, I had to make a choice of what do I do to make sure that I don't stay here. And so that, that was the beginning of me becoming the person that I was, you know. Until then, I was just going along with whatever was happening. I was a child. But at that moment, I said, no, no, I am not going to stay here. I have to make some decisions, and I have to stick to them, and I have to respect my decision making, and I'm not going to let other people change that. And that's, that's what changed in, in my life. And so so that, that has actually expanded my entire life and the horizons that I now see. I no longer see just walls. I actually see the horizons behind and beyond those walls. Thank you, Esmeralda. So, please again help me thank you, Esmeralda, for such a wonderful presentation today. And Esmeralda, I'm sure your words um, have been of great inspiration throughout the years for many people in this room, and that has shown in all the people that have spoken to you today. So we, again, we thank you for being here. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Um, um, 
the books have arrived for those of you who are interested in buying some of her books. And Esmeralda, in a few minutes, she's going to be outside signing some books. She's going to take a quick break, uh, but she'll be outside signing books as well. I want to thank again the San Antonio Public Library for allowing us to be here, uh, to the director, Ramiro Salazar and Haley Holmes. Um, you want to say something? Yes, I'm sorry. I, I promised Frank I would. Um, Esmeralda's books are available in both English and Spanish and abridged on Audible and her website, esmeralda.santiago.com, as well to follow her. All right. Thank you. Thank you to the volunteers. Thank you for being here. Enjoy your weekend.